the um, lecture on environmental science. I am Mrs. Jewett. And I'm Mrs. Shram. And um, we're going to go through this lecture and it'll be posted as a video and we're also going to do some things in class. And we know you're super excited because we've heard lots of feedback that you like it when we do it this way. So enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. All right, as we've already, already talked about, environmental science now is a mini lesson to which we're really just going to go ahead and add humans to what we already know about the environment. The environment broadly described is really ecology. So we did that first, that you understand really how the environment should work, but we kind of pulled humans out of it. Now we're going to add humans and our human actions into the picture, or sort of overlay humans into this, and that's what environmentalism is. So there's a great quote on here, because we know that we have to maintain resources, not just for ourselves, but for our kids and our kids' kids and so on. So the idea here is to talk about some of the pitfalls that human activities certainly cause, and then end it on a positive note with some of the innovative ideas that humans have developed and will continue to develop. And heck, maybe one of you guys is a budding engineer and you'll solve these world problems for us. I want you to take a few minutes and write this, uh, drive this diagram down into your notes. We want you to have this visible because at the core of our conversation, this entire diagram summarizes the entire aspect of environmentalism. What we're looking for is something called sustainability. If you'll notice, it's in the bullseye of the diagram because if we can align all of these other larger components, we can reach sustainability. Sustainability just means that whenever we use resources, we're not using them to their whole or entirety. We're trying to use them in a responsible way so that there's things left for future generations. So you'll notice social, ecological, and economic are the large scale circles. Then bearable, equitable, and viable also have to be aligned. If all these things do align, that's when we reach sustainability or the ability to use a resource and not use it up but use it in a responsible way. The definition for sustainability is here at the top for you. And again, take a few minutes. Please draw this into your notebooks so that when we ask you to get the sustainability diagram out, you have it without technology. If you need a few minutes, go ahead. We're going to move on, but do go back and get that in your notes, please. OK, we're actually going to go through the Think Pair Shares in class. Uh, in other words, we're going to use uh, each other as a resource to go through each of the sustainable uh, selected uh, areas that we just talked about. These are the same big areas you just saw on the diagram. So you don't really have to do anything with this now, but you can certainly read through it. We will again do this together in class. And here it is with an example. So again, won't mean a lot to you now. We're going to sort of govern this with you in class, so just don't really worry about this now. Uh, just read through it and we'll move through the slideshow. Why are we doing all this? Well, because we don't want this to happen. I know that some of you are going to be insulted and think, oh, I'm not, I'm not stupid, and no one's saying that. But we do tend to use our resources in a way that isn't always the best for the planet. So this is just some humor to get you started. OK, in an overview of environmentalism, and since we're talking about this being a mini unit, we certainly don't have time to talk about everything that could possibly be environmental science. In fact, we have an entire year-long dual enrollment class, if you're interested in these topics, where we dive much deeper into all of these topics. For you guys, as an overview, we're going to really look at just how humans impact the Earth, the byproducts of how we produce and use energy, natural disasters that affect the Earth, both that are exaggerated by human activity and naturally occurring, ways that humans should and do manage resources, and our impact on the overall diversity of our planet. So to start, one of the things we're looking at is the ways that we actually uh, sort of really become part of the problem. We're going to talk about water usage and pollution, climate change, air pollution, overconsumption and exploitation, and solid waste. You'll recognize a lot of these terms from your vocab, so feel free to use that sheet as we go to help fill in the meanings of these words so that you're speaking environmentalism like a pro. All right, the planet supplies us with all our resources. That's sort of a no-duh factor. Where else would they come from? But sometimes when we utilize those resources, we don't really think about the long and short-term impacts on the planet. In other words, we tend to try to go for it and just get what we need because that's kind of how we live. So we're going to really talk about the way that we change some basic things about our, our environment, like the water cycle, carbon cycle, and nitrogen cycles. When we start to change those, we change the climate and we change the soil. Why are those two big areas of focus? Well, because we kind of need a healthy climate and a good source of our atmosphere to be clean, and soil gives us food and oxygen. When we talk about this, the goal is not to make anybody feel bad about our choices. It's about awareness of our choices, and then eventually to come up with a plan that's much more long-term. That's the sustainability word. That's the S word. That's going to be the fulcrum of this particular mini unit. We're going to look at conservation plans, too, and alternatives to some of our choices as we go. 
Water is definitely our greatest resource. We know we use it in a lot of different ways. We use it for personal use, and we use it for recreation, we use it in agriculture. Water management really helps communities thrive. Without water and clean water, we have a problem. So we're looking at water pollution a little bit here, and some of the things that are connected to water, air and water, for example, so that we can see how it is that we can even live. Think about the population of Phoenix and Glendale. Are we above pay in terms of water? The answer is yes. How? Because we have technology. Think about it. We have over 6 million people in the greater Phoenix area. Phoenix is a desert. There's no way 6 million human beings could do all these things like recreation, agriculture, etc. if we didn't have the technology. So we have increased our K for water usage because of technology. Are there harms in that? Absolutely. And we'll talk about some of that when we talk about water pollution. As far as water goes, we know that there's a huge battle for water. They're called the water wars. If you look at this map right here, you can see that there are seven states involved in the Colorado River usage and allocation and two countries, us and Mexico. There are huge amounts of litigation going on about who gets that water. Why? Because no water, no life. So we know it's not just about getting water, it's about conserving water and reducing the pollution we have on the water. Here's a picture of one of the lakes here in Arizona. You can see by the water lines, it's way low. And that's a concern. We'll talk about Arizona and our neighboring states here in just a second. California, you probably all heard, is under some serious water shortages. These are the worst droughts they've seen in decades. Here's a before and after in just three years. Some of the things that they're already having to deal with is no water usage for things like cleaning your driveway, watering lawns or vegetation, washing your car at home, running any kind of fountains or decorations, and new construction pools are restricted. Think about what that means for us here. We're in a desert too, so how come we don't have all these problems? Well, we do. You can see the drought in this area. Of course, it's worse on the West Coast where current conditions are really bad. But look at Arizona. We have some areas of concern too, as, do te as does Texas and other parts that are drying out. This graph's a little bit hard to read, so I'll let you look at it for a few minutes, but we're going to move on. This just tells you sort of the, the percentiles of water at certain watering stations throughout the state. Even the green and blue areas are only between 76 and 90 percent full. The dark blue are only at 90, and the high ones are black. Look at how few black dots there are. That tells you that our water reserves in this state are low. Many of them are down into this coloration here, which means they're only at about a 10 to 15 or 20 percent full. That means that they're already way below because we know that we've got some shortages. How come we don't have water restrictions then? That's a great question. It's very political, and we'll talk more about it in class. A connection now between water and water pollution is this, some, this concept called biomagnification. It's an air-water connection. Remember in the water cycle we talked about things like evapotranspiration and then precipitation, evaporation and precipitation? Well, things or compounds can get picked up and mixed with the water, and then those things can be available to organisms. One such concept is called biomagnification. If you use your root words, bio means life, magnification means to exaggerate or make worse. So these are pollutants or toxins that get mixed in the water, either because we put them in there in the air and then they end up in precipitation in water sources like the ocean. And so what happens is as the producers absorb that toxin, it gets worse. Then the smaller heterotrophs eat them, it gets worse. Again, heterotrophs, heterotrophs, and all the way to the top. Look at these numbers on the side. This is the magnification process. Why does this happen? Because the toxin stays in the muscle tissue. As the animal or plant absorbs those toxins, they store that. Then the next item that eats that in the food chain starts to build up more and more toxins as well. So by the time we get to the top of the food chain, which by the way is humans, we really see the effects of that toxin. It's bad down here, it's worse up here because we've magnified it through the food chain. As larger and larger organisms consume things, even those smaller numbers get big real fast because we store more. DDT is a chemical that was used to kill insects on agricultural plants, and we stopped using it in the United States because of this magnification. It was wiping out things like bald eagles that are really important to us as a symbol of the United States. Unfortunately, our neighbors to the south still use it. So think about weather. Do we control water and rain? No. So we still see DDT in our environment because it comes in from foreign countries. And eventually top consumers are the worst because we get the largest dose because all the things below us that we've consumed have stored that toxin. Acid rain is another problem. With some of the products that we talk about, and Mrs. Jewett will get to that in a minute, the byproducts of making energy or making fat manufacturing uh, certainly have uh, some effects on the entire system. 
there's not a way to separate water and air because they're mixed in our atmosphere. So some of the things that we produce cause acids to form. Those acids get picked up in water droplets and then those water droplet, droplets rain. So what happens if I add a toxin that makes things lower in their pH and then it rains? Do you really want to be standing under rain that's got a 4.6 pH? If you need to, review the pH scale. This is very caustic and can damage buildings and cars and humans and crops. So we have a problem with that. How do we get from this normal pH, which yes, is slightly acidic. If you remember that pH is normally seven, it's because normal water has other things in it too that are harmful. This is because of human byproducts in the way we produce energy and other manufacturing. Okay, so again, uh, the idea here is that yes, natural normal occurring rain does have a slight acidic nature, but 5.6 to 4.6, on a scale of pH is huge. So we're adding compounds in the way we do things that cause the rain to become more acidic. Again, we'll explain the connection in class. And in fact, we have a whole lab on this that we can explain it better. And here's a picture of how that cycle works. So what I said before is true. We're picking Pierce pollutants. Those particular uh, particulates and compounds get picked up and mixed with H2O. Then here's your evaporation. Then here's your, your uh, precipitation. Now the only difference is we've added something to this precipitation that's caused it to be polluted. That causes the rain to be lower in pH. That low pH falls on the surface of our planet, kills everything that it hits that's susceptible to that, causes problems for humans, causes problems for fish and water life, and again, just continues to go around and around again. Here are some pictures of a uh, statue that was made of concrete. Concrete is particularly susceptible to acidic compounds. You can see it's all eroded. This is an entire forest. All the leaves are gone. These trees are dead. They're dead because they can't withstand that acidic environment. If trees die, remember, no food, no oxygen, no ecological system because we don't have the bottom of our pyramid. Smog is another concept that we hear a lot about, and it's, again, an air pollutant quality that also can have something to do with water, but we're sort of moving away from water now and more into air. Air quality is definitely an issue. We all breathe, so if we're polluting the air, just like if we're polluting the water, it's a problem. When we talk about smog, it's really sort of a conglomerate or a mix of different things. It's really things like smoke and fog if we live near the water, or smoke and dust in our case in Arizona. Smog is what happens when you're hiking over there at Thunderbird Park and you look back down to the city to the south and you can barely see the buildings, you can barely see anything distinguishing because it's all covered in this haze. That's a problem with certain primary compounds called nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and ozone. These are all compounds we'll talk more about, but these are not good. They come into the environment because of things like using fossil fuels to burn or to do factories that use, again, fossil fuels. Anytime we have a reaction, if you think about those laws of thermodynamics, not everything we put into the, the, the machinery comes out um, as usable energy. We lose something in the system. Part of those byproducts are pollutants. When those pollutants mix, some things like this or this, this, this or this, we have a problem. Ozone's interesting in that when ozone is very high in the atmosphere, it protects us from UV and it's actually a really good thing. But when ozone is close to the earth and we breathe it in, it causes huge amounts of problems. Ozone and these other compounds, along with tiny particulates that get stuck in our lungs, cause all kinds of respiratory problems, asthmas. They can cause uh, mild things like burning and watering eyes, all the way to hospitalization and death. Air quality issues are estimated for 50,000 deaths a year, particularly with young people and elderly people, because it's really hard if your lungs aren't functioning because they've taken in substances like this, produced because of the way we live, it's a problem. We want clean air just like we want clean water. I'll give it now to Mrs. Jewett. All right, so now we're going to talk about the ways in which we use energy and the types of energy we use and the byproducts of those. So we can really break energy down into two groups, renewable or non-renewable. So renewable means that the source is able to be recycled in some way or that it never uses up. Um, non-renewable means that we are, can use it um, faster than it will replenish itself. So it might be able to be replenished, but it takes millions of years in order for it to be replen replenished. So now take a minute and think of examples of each of those. This is something that you've learned before, so you should probably have a good idea of what types of energy fall into each of those categories. And then which one are we relying more heavily on and why do you think that is? This um, graph here just shows us the type of energy consumption that we use um, 
in the worldwide, right? So as you can see, the fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, coal, those are much higher on this graph than the renewable energies. Notice that this graph is a little bit older. It stops here having real data in 97, um, and these are all projections. If you take a look at this graph, this one shows um, up until 2010, much more recent. So notice here we have a little dip in the coal why do you think that that might be? Probably because that's when the green movement started, that we had um, a real push for not for renewable energy sources, for trying different things, and for less pollution. However, we realized that that really wasn't something that we were able to live with. You know, it wasn't falling into that sustainable category, and we weren't able to have the um, amenities that we were used to and started using that coal again. Notice we have liquids up here, like the um, you know, crude oil way up at the top. That's what we use for um, almost all of our transportation. So that one's a really big one here. Notice that all of the lines are increasing. You know, as the population of our planet grows, we need to have more energy. So all of them are getting larger. It's just some are getting growing faster than others. All right. So what we rely on a lot is hydrocarbon fuels. Hydrocarbons um, are things like oil and um, gas things that are fossil fuels. These things, when we burn them, release many harmful byproducts, particularly carbon dioxide. So the way that hydro hydrocarbons were formed was organisms that lived millions of years ago, they were buried and had been under intense pressure and heat for a long period of time. So all of those things, the plants were sucking carbon dioxide out of the air, out of the air millions of years ago, and they were buried, and that carbon was buried with them. Now it's underneath the ground. We take that carbon out and release it artificially into the air, putting in a lot of excess carbon dioxide that wouldn't be there if it weren't for humans burning it. So um, along with that carbon dioxide, we also get lots of nitrogen compounds and um, things that will cause acid precipitation and smog and also um, warming. And let me just jump in because this is back to my slide. This is the stuff I was talking about. When we talk about things like acidic precipitation or smog in the air, so water pollutant connections or air pollutant connections, this is where those are coming from, those byproducts that mix with water or air and cause pollution. Mm -hmm. So here's just a little diagram of what a hydrocarbon is. Uh, notice we have this long chain of carbons, very similar to when we talked about all those organic molecules back at the beginning of this semester. Um, but instead of having both oxygen and carbon, it's just the hydrogen and the carbon, really together depending depending on their size determines the um, type of substance that it is, right? Gasoline, um, these are smaller, making them more liquids, whereas plastic has a longer one, making it of a solid. So when we burn these, then that releases all of that carbon into the air, and the carbon combines with oxygen and other compounds to make carbon dioxide. So because of all that excess carbon that's going into the air, that's causing a climate change. Right. And so we want to just now take a minute to distinguish between global warming, climate change, and weather. And long, well, in the long haul, weather patterns predict that climate. But climate can be changed due to things like the tilt of Earth's axis or the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So there is no... Um, there's, there's a consensus that climate change is occurring. There is no um, debate about whether or not it is occurring. The climate is on our planet is definitely increasing over time. And so keep in mind that when you hear things like it could be caused by something else, we know that in our existence, we're not having any change in our axes. We're not having any change in the distance of the sun to the earth. So the one factor that remains is the human activity that causes climate change. Scientists are in agreement that it is climate change caused by those human activities and nothing else. So when you see somebody stand up and say, but it's the coldest winter I've ever seen. It's the, it's the wettest winter I've ever seen. How is this climate change? How are things warming? Remember, that's weather, not climate. So most predominantly the greenhouse gases that are warming our atmosphere are CO2 and methane, which is CH4. These two things um, are really strong greenhouse gases, but also water is a greenhouse gas. So as the climate gets warmer, that makes water evaporate more, which then causes the climate to be warmer, which then causes more water to evaporate, and it just continue, continues that cycle. So um, those greenhouse gases, CO2, CH4, and also water, 
um, they create a blanket effect that holds in the sun's energy. So this causes dramatic changes in the seasons and the weather. We see drying of rivers and lakes. We see places where the sun, the flowers are starting to bloom earlier and the summers um, are coming earlier and the winters are delayed. More severe weathers too, like fires and flooding and things like that, where it's not necessarily that the climate is just getting warmer, but it's changing in ways that we haven't seen before. And part of that is too, if you guys are suffering from allergies, if you look at the data, there's never, this is unprecedented allergy seasons because everything that's supposed to sort of space out where you might have some bad times and then some good times, everything's blooming earlier and longer. So we have all kinds of molds and seeds in the air and pollen that are causing all kinds of problems. So think about what that does to agriculture. If I normally grow my crops in a specific time and now those crops are blooming sooner, but the pollinators aren't there because they're still hibernating, how am I going to have foods if I can't grow crops because it's too dry or too wet or too hot or too cold because local weather has changed because of climate? How am I going to run my, fa my farm? It's a huge problem and we need to talk about it. All right, so um, with climate change, some other things that are really contributing to this is clear cutting of forests and desertification. These are two words that you found on your vocabulary list, so you might want to refer back to those now. Um, clear cutting is when all of the trees are cut down um, in a forest, and we often do this in rainforests to make room for farmland, which is really silly because the soil in a um, in a tropical rainforest is really bad and it doesn't support crops for a very long period of time and then they just end up being deserts. There's nothing there because the the soil can't really sustain crops for very long. So um, when we burn fossil fuels um, we see the increase in volatile gases or volatile organic compounds, that's what the VOCs is, and also in nitrogen concentration. So this NOx here, those are the nitrogen compounds that we talked about like in the nitrogen cycle where we have um, the NO2, NO3, really this X is just a placeholder, it's a variable like you would see in math. So any of those NO compounds those can also be seen in concentrations in the atmosphere, which also lead to poor air quality here, like smog and air pollution and the acid rain that we've been talking about. So burning fossil fuels really contributes to disrupting all of those chemical cycles and disrupting um, lots of different aspects of the environment. Um, we, there's no really way for us to burn coal cleanly. So right now, coal is the primary way in which we produce electricity. We burn coal in a factory that turns turbines that allows us to store electricity and that's how we get most of our electricity. We do put that, the products of that through scrubbers and try and get it as clean as possible, but it can't be 100% clean. Anything that we take out of the air that's been scrubbed then now we just have a solid waste instead of a gaseous waste and that has to be put somewhere. Um, and there's no way to get all of those toxins out of the air. So anytime you see those factories, the electric factories with the large smokestacks and the steam coming out of them, it's mostly steam, but it's not all steam and it never can be because it can't get it 100% clean. So all of these cycles that we talked about in ecology, the carbon cycle, water cycle, and nitrogen cycle, those are all impacted um, by the burning of fossil fuels. So. The planet has a natural greenhouse effect, right? So our atmosphere here traps some heat for us because the natural greenhouse gases, like remember CO2, methane, and water, the energy from the sun gets trapped in those and those chemicals kind of hold on to the energy from that sun and keep them um, next to the Earth's surface. This is a greatly, dr dr uh, very dramatic showing here. Um, the atmosphere is not really that big. And it's not, yes, yeah, not to scale. <laughs> not to scale at all, but you get the idea. So the natural greenhouse effect is very important for our planet because it keeps us at a livable temperature. We're far enough away from the sun that if we didn't have these greenhouse gases and we didn't have anything keeping us warm, that the planet would be too cold to be habitable. We need some of this greenhouse effect in order to keep our planet to have liquid water so that we can have plants and animals that live on it. The problem is that by putting excess greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, that creates an exaggerated or human-caused greenhouse effect by adding in those CH4, the CO2, and the H2O as a gaseous form that causes the greenhouse effect to be increased. So that's what's causing climate change. This is the normal greenhouse effect. This is very good and very important for our planet to have this, but when we 
get those extra compounds into the atmosphere, then that's when we see greatly exaggerated increase in those temperatures. And that's what causes the ice to melt and the water to evaporate and the desertification and the flooding and all of those things that we see occurring with the climate change. So even though greenhouse effect is a natural thing, human enhanced greenhouse effect is not. So in order to reach to do something about it, what we really want to do is reach sustainability for all of our resources. The problem is that with our lifestyle so heavy in technology and so heavy in consumerism that we're not able to kind of back off and not use all of those um, all of those items in order to meet, reach this sustainability. Our um, society is really big into overconsumption of things and exploitation of resources and getting the very most biggest best of everything so um, think about this thing per share what's the difference in overconsumption compared to sustainability you can probably answer that in just one word all right so here are some ways that humans overconsume or exploit our resources one invasive species and this has an asterisk after it because we're going to go into more detail on later slides but what an invasive species is is just something that was brought into that environment that didn't originally live there um, it can be brought in accidentally or on purpose by humans for some reason so we'll look at more details on that in a moment another way is by clear-cutting forests we do this a lot in rainforests, as I talked about earlier, to make room for agriculture, which is completely ridiculous because we don't want to use that soil for agriculture anyway. But those are areas in which people are not defending those forests, and so people can go in and get really cheap land, cut the trees down, and use it for a couple seasons, and then just leave it to be a desert, which is horrible for our planet because the plants are what takes the carbon dioxide out. So we're putting all of this carbon dioxide in by burning the fossil fuels and then cutting down the only things that can get it back out. Um, also, we produce non-reusable materials, particularly solid waste, trash, lots of things like that. And again, that has an asterisk because we'll come back to it in a moment. And urban sprawl. So when we talk about urban sprawl, um, if you notice on your vocabulary, that's the expansion of the cities into farther and farther outreaches into, that, into the wilderness, right? So this is kind of um, causes that secondary succession. We're causing habitat destruction. And it's um, done to natural habitats to develop land. The farther we move out in our city, you know, we're still moving up north. You know, Anthem is still expanding out. And we continue to just move into those areas and kill any plants or animals that are living there just so that we can have room to pa to have a larger house you know i need room for my pool and my fountain and my indoor bowling or <laughs> and all of these things that maybe we don't really need but we just we want to have the biggest and the best of everything and we don't really care what that cost may be so going back to invasive species, an invasive species is an organism that's brought to a new area and then those organisms end up out competing the things that natively live there. So why would that happen? And we have two distinct categories here, inter intentional and accidental. So take a minute to think about that. What would, um, why would this happen? How could an organism out compete something that has been evolved to live there? So here are some examples of invasive species. This is an emerald ash borer, and as you can see, they're really tiny. Um, but these were brought over from Asia, and they make their little tunnels under the bark of trees, and then it ends up really being damaging to the trees. Also, they um, eat the leaves, and they end up killing large numbers of trees here. So these are not native, so the plants don't have any defense against these guys. Um, in the, the area that they're native to in Asia, those trees might have some kind of compound that they can't digest or something that stops these guys from eating them. But here, we don't have any of those defenses. And if you have read about these at all, they're a real problem in northern Arizona. They've killed tons of aspen trees up north. So then what happens is we get an imbalance in our ecosystem and that causes death of these trees, which causes our fire season to be worse because we don't have living trees to help ward off fires. We have dead trees. And so it becomes a huge problem. As Mrs. Jewett said, there's, there's that lack of evolutionary arms race that we talked about last unit, where normally something that's being preyed upon develops resistance to that and, and ways to fight this off. These guys don't because they're just introduced in unnaturally. Mm -hmm. So would this be, um, this was a, an accidental one. Um, we brought logs over from Asia for building purposes and these guys happened to be in them and then were released into our country accidentally. So this is a really big problem for these guys. Um, 
Here's another one, the cane toads. This one um, is occurring in Australia, and these guys were actually brought over on purpose. Um, the, uh, there was a big pest problem there with uh, lo some locusts and some other organisms there that were eating crops. So they brought these cane toads over thinking that if they were to eat those, and there would be plenty of things in Australia to kill them because everything in Australia wants to kill you. So they didn't <laughs> think that there was going to be a problem except for the fact that these glands on the sides of the cane toad secrete a poison that makes them so that other organisms do not prey upon them. So this particular species that they chose to bring over, as you can see, is quite large. Um, and nothing can eat it because when they bite it, um, which, you know, a predator is going to go for its head area, the glands are right here, and they're going to bite straight into those poison glands and then release that toad so that it won't get, so it won't get eaten. Um, and then, since the things living on Australia have, again, not been evolving with this organism, there aren't things there that have developed a resistance to that poison to an order, in order to stop these po this population from growing. Um, let's see, another invasive species is the zebra mussels. And these guys um, were another, this is an accidental one because as you can see they attach to the sides of boats or shopping carts that fell into a lake or even other, you know, other organisms that are living in there and they just cover everything. Um, and so this, you know, pushes out organisms that might be attached to those rocks in other places uh, and, you know, just kind of takes over the whole freshwater ecosystem. And something else I just noticed, which cracks me up, is we spelled muscles wrong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like your arm muscles from working out. That's hilarious. You get the idea. And this is a problem in Lake Pleasant, if you've noticed their campaign that says don't move a muscle, which is kind of funny that we did it this way because we are kind of making fun. But uh, if you move them, they come in on boats and then they clog up the waterway so we can't release water for irrigation because there's too many muscles. That's why they have that campaign for boaters not to move them. All right, and then the last one is the Burmese python. This one is kind of, um, this one's on purpose, really intentional by people, but more due to people's ignorance than bringing them over for, um, you know, like they did in Australia for a purpose. So sometimes people will think it's a good idea to have a Burmese python as a pet, which I happen to agree because I think snakes are just awesome animals. I do too. But then they tend to get a little large and people don't really know how to take care of them. So instead of disposing of them properly, they decide to just release them into the wild. And as you can see, they can grow to be extremely large. Um, even here, this one's eating an alligator. And so they just take over. This is a big problem in Florida. Um, in fact, you can actually go out and hunt pythons and get um, a bounty for them if you kill pythons in Florida because there's just such a huge problem with these guys killing the natural wildlife like they do here or endangering people coming into their homes, um, in their yards, and threatening their pets and all kinds of things. And again, as Mrs. Jewett said, there's no natural predators for a snake that size. So once they get to be that big, they're the top dog, so to speak. And so, although they'd eat the dog, uh, they're definitely something to be reckoned with. And there was another problem in the Florida Everglades where people who were having them for pets, as Mrs. Jewett said, uh, during storms, those pets got released. And so during hurricane season, some of those uh, cages were uh, tipped over. And so obviously people had to leave the area and those pets escaped. And now they're in the wild reproducing like crazy because there's no pressure on them. There's, their carrying capacity is high because there isn't any uh, predation on them. Right. So this last one is a plant called the kudzu. And it's this vine here that you can see. And it grows extremely fast. It can grow up to a foot in just a day. Oh. It is extremely fast growing, and I mean, people get their cars covered if they leave them parked there for just a relatively short period of time. Um, they were brought over intentionally because they are good in gardens, because they have these really pretty flowers here, um, but then they grow so fast that they get out of control really quickly, and they just grow up and over trees. See, all of these like pillars of kudzu are other trees that they have just grown over and covered. So now these trees can't photosynthesize because they can't get the sunlight that the kudzu is covering them. Um, they even cover telephone poles and lights and houses and everything. So um, it's really hard to get rid of because um, not only are they a legume, so they don't have that nitrogen limitation like other plants do, and they grow so fast that it's really hard to just, you know, get rid of them. So these are all over, especially the south in the United States um, where it's 
wet enough for them to grow really quickly. And I also heard that they produce sort of a bitter taste, so nothing wants to eat them, because they thought maybe they could get cattle or something to graze those areas, but they don't even like it, and cows will eat anything. <laughs> All right, so um, moving on to solid waste, we can break solid waste down into two distinct categories of biodegradable or non-biodegradable. Biodegradable materials are things that can be broken down by microorganisms, um, and non-biodegradable means that they can't. That's things that, you know, like the glass and the plastic stuff that cannot be broken down by any natural process. So um, a lot of those things we don't even really think about, you know, bottle caps and things like that where they get stuck um, in the water system, you know, and we have these large floats of just trash in the ocean and then they get eaten by birds. This is a skeleton of a bird here. You can see some of the feathers still and this is the things that were in its stomach when it died because birds are stupid and they don't know the difference between a plastic bottle cap and something that they should be eating. So um, there is a big trend now with kind of having um, you know, chip bags or things that claim to be biodegradable, but a lot of the times those things that claim to be biodegradable are really not very biodegradable. So um, don't trust those packaging. Really, the stuff that is biodegradable is primarily like food stuff, food waste um, that we can keep out of our trash and use it as compost and things like that to reduce our solid waste. Um, this is something we're also going to look at closer when we do our landfill lab. When you get to bust out those beautiful landfills <laughs> that you created several months ago, it'll be awesome. Finally, yay! <laughs> All right. So what cycles are going to be affected by the production of solid waste by clear cutting and desert desertification? Take a moment to talk about that. Or, I mean, when we're in class, talk about it. I don't, you well, can talk to your yeah. pet about it right now if you, you want. You can talk to yourself. <laughs> All right, so we can kind of take all of these concerns that we've just talked about and put them into a nice little handy acronym that can help you to remember the different things of the big environmental impacts that humans have. So that, that um, acronym is HIPPO, stands for H for habitat loss, I for invasive species, P for pollution and also population growth, specifically talking about human population growth, and then over harvesting. So the population growth, I feel, kind of encompasses a lot of those others because population growth leads to more using more resources and more pollution and more harvesting and all those all of those things. All right. So here is just um, some graphs. We're going to go through a couple of maps to just show you some information here. But if you take a look at these, this is energy consumption per person, and this is in 2010. Um, and the darker the color, if you look over here. That means that the more energy is used per person, and if we get down into the blues here, that means that less energy is used per person. And you can see that here in the United States and in Canada, we use a lot of energy. So does Australia over here in Europe. Iceland is really dark, um, but a lot of their energy is geothermal, so they're not doing a whole lot of greenhouse gas or greenhouse um, gas emissions by doing that. But um, you know, that's why they're so dark over there. But then we see the less industrialized nations down here that are not using very much energy per person at all. They don't use electricity on a daily basis. They don't have the comforts that we have, such as, you know, running water and electricity and electronics and all of those things that you have to charge every night. And so keep in mind, this brings up a good point, because when you ask people typically, do you think that developed countries like Europe, like the United States, like Canada, Australia, use more or less energy than the developing countries, people tend to think that the developing countries are using more, but it's just not true. Like Mrs. Jewett said, we have a lot of stuff that requires power, which may be just fine. But as we also see, China wants that lifestyle. India would like that lifestyle. Right now, they use relatively low energy compared to us, but that's changing every day. As they develop our way of life, What's going to happen when we all want that kind of power usage? The Earth just can't sustain that. It's called your ecological footprint, and we'll be doing an activity later to calculate our footprints and talk about what that means when everybody's trying to live like us, and there's only one planet. So this one, you're, this um, diagram here, you're going to need to copy this down in your notes so that you have it without looking at an electronic resource. And um, we're going to focus here on this right now, but you can see about 81% of our energy usage comes from fossil fuels, and only 16% is renewable. That is a big difference. We really need to increase this wedge of renewable in order to be a sustainable society as far as energy goes. And um, we do have this little sliver of nuclear here, but for the most part, 
our energy comes from fossil fuels. Um, for renewables, traditional biomass makes up a pretty big one here. Um, and especially in a, other countries, they use a lot of biomass to create their electricity. Like, um, you know, some countries, I think it's Sweden, has to actually buy trash from other countries in order to burn it to produce enough electricity for their country because they don't have enough trash um, in order to do that. Or we use hydropower like dams. Um, you know, the Hoover Dam allows all of those flashy lights in Las Vegas to keep running because they have so much water flowing through that dam and turning turbines, which charge batteries and use for electricity. Um, look at this tiny little wedge right here, though. Um, wind, solar, and biomass power generation. That's electricity right there. That tiny little wedge is what we're using for electricity from all of those sources combined, which is nothing. That's such a small segment of what compared to what we could be doing with those. Um, and then biomass, solar, and geothermal. These ones for the heating really um, have a lot to do about where in the country you live because some areas are much more conducive to things like geothermal heating and hot water than other countries are. And keep in mind, as Mrs. Jewett said, this whole part of the wedge right here, this comes from fossil fuels, which are dangerous to get. Um, there's lots of accidents when we try to get the, fo the, the fossilized organisms out of the ground. Refining that those organisms into something usable is extremely messy and environmentally damaging. We have oil spills that, that cause life uh, loss for humans and other animals. Plus, when we talk about smog, air pollution, acidic rain, water pollution, water shortages. That's all because we rely on this right here. It's all intricately involved in the way we generate power. So really the big question is what can we do to reach that sustainability? Because we talk about all of this in class, but really the goal is for us as a society to move toward that sustainability. So we need to do things in real life, not just in class, in order to make that happen. So what we can do is reduce usage and consumption. But in order to do that, we have to provide some kind of incentive for people in order to reduce their usage. Because, yeah, it's very nice to say, let's stop using as much water. Let's not use as much electricity. But then when you get home, you're still going to charge your phone, and you're still going to play on your iPad, and you're still going to watch TV just the same as you always have, unless you have some kind of incentive to do it. So that's what the stick and carrot is. Um, it's an incentive of some kind to get people to reduce their consumption and reduce their usage. Um, reforestation, obviously we need to plant trees when we cut them down. Trees or biomass can be a renewable resource, but we have to use it responsibly and we have to replace what we remove. Otherwise, it's not going to be renewable. Um, we need to develop non-fossil fuel energy providers like wind or solar. Um, so we need to make sure that we have enough wind or solar and other types of energy as well to replace that because you can't use only wind to replace fossil fuels and we can't re use only solar to replace all of the oil that we use. We have to have lots of different ways to replace those. So right now, brainstorm some ways that you think we can make changes in society and what can national and global leaders do to promote sustainability. And remember, ultimately you are involved in the global scale and in the political scale because you vote. And so eventually when you get old enough, you're going to vote for candidates that also have the same uh, level of concern about the planet because we want you and your kids and your kids' kids to have a clean living. So here is a, another map just to kind of give you an idea of the renewable electricity production. So these either don't do renewable energy or we don't have any data for them or they have such a low electricity usage that they don't need to really produce a whole lot. But um, notice that most of the planet is sitting there under the less than 5% most of the ones that are measurable here. Um, a few are 5% or above, you know, predominantly here in Europe um, or down here. And then some, very few, are greater than 15% here and um, up in Europe mostly. But greater than 15%, is that really our standard? That in order to be doing well, you need to be greater than 15%? I think it can be a lot higher than that if we really figure out how to do it. And if you go back to the slide that uh, Mrs. Jewett showed you about energy consumption, you'll see a really strange relationship here. Those countries that are the lowest in alternative energies and the ones that have the greatest reliant on fossil fuels are also the ones that have the most energy needs, which is kind of scary because we're putting all our eggs in one basket in those fossil fuels. All right. 
And if you look at this map, this just shows the renewable electricity technology that's being used. So, um, let's see. All right, so the reason this one's all broken down here is because we are using all of these different types, right? So we have a lot going on here. We're um, working on a lot of different ways to create some new technologies, but just none of it is really reaching the amount of electricity that we use. So, yeah, so all we're doing here is this, these are just the different uh, the rankings. And so, for instance, let's just look at water power. Uh, the United States is the third largest to use hydropower in the world because we do a lot of damming. And then if you look at certain solar panels versus um, STEGs are using really uh, biomass in a different way. It's the energy off of those. Geothermal wind. You can see we're, you know, we're in there in a lot of things, but this is just such a small percentage. So we have the technology. We just have to be willing to, to use it more and say as consumers, we want clean energy. And that way we become much more prevalent in these areas and not just talk about them, but actually use them. All right, so now you're going to take a minute and think about what makes converting to alternative fuels such a hard thing for us. Why, have, why are we so reluctant to switch over to alternative fuels? All right, well, here are several reasons, right? So for one, there is no one-to-one -one energy producing solution, meaning that there's not just one thing that can replace all coal or all fossil fuels in general. We need to have a really wide variety of energy production in order to replace the fossil fuels that we're currently burning. And so it can't just be, there's no one miracle solution that we're going to be able to just come in and all of a sudden stop using coal. It's just not going to happen. We need to kind of wean ourselves off of that while increasing in other areas. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> I can do the next one. Okay. Yeah, go. <laughs> okay. Infrastructure is another thing. We have our economy since the Industrial Revolution has been around using fossil fuels in some way, shape, or form. Coal, diesel, gas. So you can go to the corner and see two or three gas stations. Where's your local hydrogen station? Where's your local solar power charging station? We just don't have the infrastructure yet. So it's going to cost billions of dollars to wean ourselves, as Mrs. Jewett said, away from the structure that supports fossil fuel usage and into alternative usage. That's going to cost a lot of money, but in the end, it will be worth it because overall costs will go down. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cost as well. Right now, things are expensive. Uh, for instance, if you're looking at hydrogen fuel cells, it costs about $47 a, a kilowatt of power compared to fuel, uh, fossil fuels, which is still about five or six. So people don't want to pay that yet. So that slows the development because people don't want to have to invest. But soon, we won't have choices. We'll have to find something else if we want to make the planet more sustainable. And that means those costs will come down as we are more willing to pay them in the initial run. Mm -hmm. um, and attitudes about it, when you speak to someone, usually their attitudes about fossil fuels are really, or, or fossil fuels are really negative and alternative energies are really positive. Yeah, we, want, we need all of these alternative energies, but then not when it comes to actually doing something about it. Nobody wants to actually spend the money to get, um, you know, an electric car or to get the, the resources or the technology to be able to produce those types of things. Nobody wants to ride the bus to work instead of driving. Nobody wants to take a cold shower or to take a shorter shower. So um, attitude isn't so much about how it is talked about, but the attitude of what you actually do. I mean, think about it. In a, just a tiny example, when your principal says, hey, she'll buy ice cream for everybody. If you pick up your own trash, we can't get people to do it. And that would be great because it's much more sustainable to not have to have maintenance people pick up your trash. And we still won't do it, even though we have this amazing opportunity to get free ice cream. <laughs> um, and then lastly, powerful oil lobbyists. So the oil companies uh, worldwide make a lot of money off of the oil that they drill and the oil that they sell and they uh, don't really want us to use alternative energies because that means that they're going to be making less money. So they have lobbyists which are people who go and um, try and convince um, senators to vote a certain way on bills and things that come up um, as laws. So instead of encouraging alternative energy use our government is actually working in a way against it um, just because we have those powerful oil companies that are not really on board. And one particular example of this is we all complain in America that oil, the price of oil is expensive in terms of at the gas pump because we often pay $329, $359, $379 a gallon. But our oil is subsidized by lobbyists who want us to continue to consume their product to make more products. 
or more profits, excuse me. If you've ever traveled to Europe or other places, oil is not subsidized, and so gas is not subsidized. And you're paying five, six, seven, even ten dollars a gallon of gas for for gasoline. Well, here it's not. So we cap the price, which means people continue to use it uh, a lot more. That generates profits. So it's very, very confusing. We understand, but there's a lot that uh, could be done. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right. So the good news here is that people are very inventive and we come up with some really cool ideas so we're going to be doing activities later on about some really radical energy production you're all very familiar with the energy production of solar and wind and hydropower you've been talking about that for a long time but there's also some really cool ways and new ways that people are um, looking at energy usage and that is all we are all done. done we are completely finished with all of the lecture for the rest of the year the last thing we're going to do is um, finish up this unit on environmental science and then head into finals. And we know that we wanted to do it this format so you could keep this forever and watch it every single day. Yeah, when you are sad that you're graduating <laughs> from high school, then you can look back on this and remember the good old days. Exactly. Thank you. But